Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveller. Long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less travelled by, that has made all the difference. Hi, welcome to Lit Poetry and our discussion today of the poem The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Robert Frost was an American poet who penned The Road Not Taken towards the beginning of World War I. While his poem is commonly understood to be about the difficulty of understanding the importance of one's life choices, the poem can also be read from a number of other perspectives. Frost was an American poet, and a much celebrated one at that. Many of his earliest poems were written and published in England where he lived with his family between 1912 and 1915. An interesting point to note about Frost was that while he didn't associate himself with any particular poetical movement, he was influenced somewhat by the imagist poets of the period, including Ezra Pound, for instance, who praised Frost's style as being full of utter sincerity. Published in 1916, The Road Not Taken appeared in Frost's collection of poems entitled Mountain Interval. Frost's career and reputation following the publication of this collection shot to prominence. The Road Not Taken takes place in a pastoral setting, which was typical of much of his later work and at a time when many of his contemporaries were turning away from the traditional verse practices of the 19th century, Frost was remaining more conservative in his approach and tended to adopt traditional or regular meters and rhyme schemes in his poems. And this is the case with this particular poem. Frost was born in San Francisco, California in 1874 and died in Boston, Massachusetts in 1963. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveller. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Line by line analysis. The famous opening lines of the poem introduce the reader to an important choice. Two roads diverge and the speaker unable to travel both. You know, he must choose between them. Right from the beginning, the speaker reveals a sense of sorrow at the situation. He or she is sorry that choosing one road excludes another. The speaker's inner conflict ushers in an important theme about the function of choice and uncertainty in life. The speaker's sorrow also draws in the idea of regret people are left with in life upon choosing one thing over another. One of the central ironies of the road not taken is that it doesn't really make any difference which road the speaker chooses as each one leads to experiences of remorse. The poem's title addresses this dilemma directly, not only signalling that the focus of the poem is the road not taken, but even implying that there is always a road not taken and with it an unshakable feeling of regret over what one might have missed out on. This hints at the old adage that humans often use that the grass is always greener on the other side. 
Frost himself even indicated at one point that he may have modelled the narrator in the poem on an acquaintance of his named Edward Thomas, whom he described as a person who, whichever road he went down, would be sorry he didn't go down the other. After line three, the poem starts to explore the uncertainty that a person making an important choice in life always has to face. The narrator describes standing at the fork where two roads diverge, suggesting that he or she spent that time pondering the best direction while struggling to see past a bend in the road that is blocking the view. It is easy to relate to this feeling of uncertainty. We all know it. This description is part of the poem's extended metaphor in which the forking road stands for all of life's choices. Uncertainty plays a decisive role in making choices and the bend in the road illustrates just how difficult it is to predict future outcomes. Here, the poem begs the question of whether it is ever possible to make entirely rational or informed decisions. Stylistically, the speaker's hesitation in the face of the choice that he or she must make is effectively illustrated through poetic language, with the repetition of the word and at the beginnings of line two, three, and four. Like a skipping or broken record, the use of repetition captures the speaker's inability to move forward in time and conveys his or her feeling of paralysis and indecision about which way to go. This effect is strengthened through Frost's use of enjambment at the ends of line two to four with the lack of punctuation creating a sense of one lengthy uninterrupted moment of hesitation or uncertainty drawn out over the three lines. This lengthening of the moment before the end stop in line five reflects the speaker's prolonged moment of uncertainty as he or she is faced with making a very difficult choice. Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. After looking down one path, the narrator now describes in the second stanza that they took the other way because it was equally enticing, but had the bonus of appearing less worn and, and more grassy. The narrator doesn't specifically say that he or she thinks that the wanting of wear is a positive quality, but subtly hints at it based on the fact that they chose the path to tread based on this very criteria. The speaker here attaches a positive connotation to the notion of not doing what most other people do. This thereby promotes the importance of individualism and non-conformity in life as a thematic concern in the poem. By having the speaker choose a road based solely on which one seems less worn, Frost on the surface at least suggests that the narrator is a non-conformist. There is a celebrated history, of course, of rugged and headstrong pioneering individuals in American verse. And here in the poem, Frost gives the semblance of following that rich tradition. Yet, later in the poem, it becomes less clear whether Frost is, in fact, promoting that core American value or artfully calling it into question. It's a tricky poem. And Frost actually says that himself in a famous quote. It is important to also point out here that much of the language the narrator uses when referring to the road comes across as if he is talking about a person. In other words, Frost brings personification to bear on the road itself, transforming it into a character within the poem. To begin with, the narrator refers to the road as fair, meaning beautiful or attractive. Next, he or she describes how the road had the better claim, as if it had made a demand on the narrator himself or herself. And to finish with, the narrator describes the road by saying it wanted wear, as if it had human desires itself and had almost whispered into the narrator's ear. In other words, the reader is privy to a conversation the narrator is having with the road, 
with one of the roads pleading a better case. This creates the impression that the road itself had some degree of influence or power over the speaker's decision. Maybe the poet does this to suggest that the path of non-conformity is seductive or to give some indication that the, the speaker's decision may not have been as clear-eyed or rational as he or she presents it. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. Insofar as the narrator chooses which road to take based on its being less travelled, the poem easily and often is interpreted as a celebration of individualism. However, these next lines of the poem throw a spanner in the works. The road not taken achieves this by exposing how the narrator's first assessment about the two roads was incorrect. In truth, the speaker admits that the paths were travelled about the same. Both are equally littered with leaves and both show few signs of disturbance. Lines 11 and 12, therefore, could be read as evidence that all experiences, despite the path taken, are unique. The apparent theme of choosing the path of non-conformity is quickly challenged by the poem's confession that it's difficult to actually evaluate the nature of the path you can take, such as which is the more non-conformist. Moving back to the poem, lines 9 to 12 should also be read with a deeper degree of scepticism as well. The narrator has already shown how, by being one traveller, he or she is unable to experience both roads, and yet now he or she declares that the two roads were worn about the same, and both equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. But the speaker can't know that the two paths were equally worn because the speaker couldn't travel both roads. These lines therefore raise questions about the speaker's credibility and in doing so, draw attention to the impossibility of doing exactly what the speaker is trying to do, which is to make sense of his or her experience by comparing the two roads. In this way, the poem creates a degree of irony that separates what the speaker is saying from what the poem is saying. The implication is that the speaker, without perhaps entirely realising it, is attempting to deal with the regret of not being able to experience the road not taken by imagining the two roads to have been really about the same. Meanwhile, the poem seems to be more broadly highlighting the human tendency to deal with complex experiences and unanswerable questions by creating comfortable and tidy, but ultimately fictional narratives. Finally, in this section of the poem, it is important to acknowledge the abundant use of assonance. The poem makes repeated use of R sounds in words such as and, passing, perhaps, and grassy. The assonance creates a pleasing melody and rhythm that connects these lines together, which is interesting because the actual meaning of the lines is oppositional. In lines 6 to 8, saying that one road is less worn than the other, while lines 9 to 12 admit that this wasn't the case. The discordance of coupling the similar sounds in the lines with the opposing meaning suggests a kind of inner discordance in the speaker themselves, which makes sense as the speaker is hoping for one thing, to take the road less traveled, while faced with a world that makes it impossible for the speaker to know if he or she will in fact achieve that desired goal. At the start of line 13, the O oh, and the following exclamation point indicate a shift in the poem. The speaker imagines a delightful solution that he or she may return to travel along the other road one day. However, the poem quickly shows that this to be a dream, a pipe dream for that matter. The narrator begrudgingly acknowledges that in the hurly-burly of life, this scenario will not eventuate. In this you know, and in this way, the narrator remains struggling with inner conflicts and regrets. 
despite the narrator's best internal rationalizations, the speaker remains beset with his or her uncertainty. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The poem shifts tense and mood in the final stanza. As the narrator pitches himself or herself in the future, the expression with a sigh indicates strong feelings attached to the memory, though the exact nature of those feelings remains a mystery. That is, people sigh for all sorts of reasons. So the speaker might be feeling a sense of contentment or relief, but he or she also might be feeling sorrow or regret. The result is that the emotional tenor of the, the speaker's imagined telling of the story remains ambiguous. All the reader knows is that the narrator is overcome by emotion. The ambiguous nature of this stanza lends itself to multiple readings, especially of the line, made all the difference. Most readers will see these final words as a nostalgic celebration of individualism. However, given that the speaker can't actually know whether he or she took the road less traveled and therefore has no idea whether it made all the difference or what precise difference or any difference at all, another more ironic reading is possible. According to this view, the narrator's sigh is probably one of sorrow or regret about the impossibility of knowing what decision was the best. The ambiguity that surrounds the speaker's sigh thus encourages the reader to explore and even embrace multiple readings of the poem. Finally, note that by this point in the poem, the speaker has transformed something that could be regarded as a trivial decision i.e. which road to take through the forest, into a moment so significant that he or she imagines retelling the story long into the future. This is one way in which Frost cues his audience to read the poem as an extended metaphor, since it's unlikely that ages and ages into the future the speaker would still be recounting this seemingly insignificant moment in the woods unless it had taken on some kind of symbolic value for him or her. With lines 16 to 17, Frost is signalling that the significance of the story lies beyond its literal meaning. Don't we tend to do that as humans? By retelling our stories, we embellish them until over time they grow into distortions of the truth of what we really saw happen. And isn't that part of our human condition, which we usually fail to be fully honest about? I mean, regardless, we tell the stories of the past and reinvent them and imbue them with new significance in order to create a curated image of the person we want to be seen as. This is a human thing that we do. And if you think about it carefully, it can be a little bit disturbing. Just how true these narratives are about ourselves, however, is up for question. Under this more ironic reading, the poem becomes about the ways in which people attribute meaning to their decisions after the fact in an attempt to fashion their life experiences into coherent narratives. By portraying the speaker's attempt to draw conclusions about the meaning of his or her choices, the poem suggests that such narratives often say more about a person's lingering uncertainties and regrets than they do about reality. In the end, while we can interpret the poem ironically and argue that it is mocking the flawed ways people manufacture narratives about themselves from the choices that they have, it's also possible to see the poem as suggesting just the opposite, that the creation of such narratives is part of being human and that the attempt to make the nonconformist choice is enough to define a life and give it a sense of purpose and dignity. The Road Not Taken is a wonderful poem because it makes you think. It supports multiple readings, multiple interpretation, and there is no correct way to read it. This poem illustrates how multiple readings can exist together in a poem without cancelling each other out. When looked at this way, the poem becomes not the simple story of a person who made a choice. 
and the outcomes of that choice, but rather a deeper exploration of the mysteries and complexities inherent in every choice. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.